Hello and welcome to Building High Performance Cultures, a weekly series where we talk to executives from top organizations on how they've built high performance cultures and how they're leveraging their cultures as competitive advantage. I'm Marty Parker, the president and CEO of Waterstone Human Capital. It's hard to believe that nine months has since passed since we've launched Building High Performance Cultures, the vlog and the podcast. And in that time, a lot's happened, of course, but I've had the chance to speak with presidents and chief executive officers of more than two dozen top Canadian organizations, many which have been recognized for their top cultures. And as we come to the end of the year, it's the perfect time to look back on some of the key learnings and cultural themes, ingredients, if you will, discussed by these leaders. First is the leader's role in culture. And without exception, high performance leaders recognize the need to take a hands-on approach when it comes to corporate culture. This is not a delegatable kind of a thing, right? It's, it's as a leader, you need to own it. And that ownership comes in lots of different forms. It comes in your participation in defining the culture, your, your ownership of defining the culture that you aspire to. It comes in your participation and engagement in teaching that culture uh, as, as, uh, as you kind of see it unfold in your, in, in your organization. Uh, and it comes with owning it in terms of your own personal behavior to make sure that, you know, that even though you define it and you teach it, that your actions will ultimately be the, 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 the story behind the story of, of culture development in the organization. So, uh, owning your own behaviors uh, that are aligned with that culture is, is uh, you know, is absolutely essential. So, you know, I would say very simply that if, you know, if you, if you believe as I do that, that uh, the, the culture, uh, how pe people behave when you're not looking is the single most important job of a leader, uh, owning that behavior uh, throughout, broadly throughout your organization is really, really important, then, you know, you got to own it. But here's the thing, when you're, um, if you're in a leadership position, if you don't make it a priority and you don't actually put time in your calendar to think about it, uh, have meetings about it, do work on culture, it's not gonna naturally happen through the business cycle. You know when you look, need to look at your monthly management meetings, you know when you're looking at the quarter, when you're looking at your annual plan, like those things come natural as part of doing business. It, it, unless you actually put time together uh, and put it in your calendar where you're gonna work on culture, it's likely not to be there. And I recognize that, you know, it is our, our singular largest competitive advantage. I mean, my competitors can hire from the same schools. They can get office space in the same cities. They can follow roughly the same strategy, go after the same customers. Yeah, why have we outperformed by, you know, 10X our nearest competitor? I would chalk it up to one thing. We've got a different culture. And so when I think of my job, it's you know, culture number one, team number two, strategy vision number three, and then the execution is sort of the last piece. The reason I put them in that order is I, I believe that if you, if you really get the culture right, then you can attract the very, very best team and, and get the, the best work out of that best team. Um, and, then, and, so, and then if you've got the right team and the right culture, they're going to help you develop the best strategy and vision. You don't have to be a a single genius, you've got a great team of really committed people that can help you there. And if you got the right team and the right culture with the right strategy and vision, execution almost takes care of itself. Now, my, my team might argue it that doesn't quite take care of itself, <laughs> but from my perspective, it's, uh, it's certainly a whole lot easier than, if, uh, than absent those things. The second theme from my discussions with leaders over the past year is the importance of leading with trust and integrity. These are the key ingredients in building a culture with a high degree of psychological safety, which is a core skill set for leaders of all high performance teams. Well, my favorite is authenticity. And if uh, you know, we describe the meaning of it as uh, it's, it's being genuinely in the moment and, and listening to someone and uh, receiving it the exact way it was delivered. Uh, it's, you know, stopping the censoring in your head so that you can really learn something from someone's opinion that you didn't otherwise know. And that leads into the embracing an ambiguity because, you know, by hearing and learning what you don't know, you're going to be in a position to do something that you've never done. I mean, that simple kind of language colors 
how we talk here. We measure our values on a bi-monthly uh, basis, actually, as part of our, uh, we have a bi-monthly survey. We have, and I, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, we have symbols of our values. For example, we have a moose in every room. I should actually just find one in the room that I'm in here. A moose on the table for us at Galvanize is like an elephant in the corner of the room, which, you know, it's that uncomfortable, awkward thing somebody wants to say. But being uh, very uh, frequent in how we talk about our values, in measuring our values and having symbols like the moose, they, they really have become a very, very big part of our culture and uh, frankly, our transformation. I'll say, um, until this job, I probably actually never really appreciated the impact of symbols and language like I do today. And uh, having a moose as a metaphor for the, the value of authenticity has been a, a really fundamental uh, focal point for our culture. And trust, I think, is all about saying you know, uh, we're going to do our absolute best to try and find a path through this. And we're going to make the best decisions that we can with the information that we have and be as transparent as we can be about those decisions. And we're going to know that we're going we're gonna to make some good decisions and we're probably going to make a couple of bad ones too. And when we make the bad ones, if we have the right people at the table that have a diverse way of thinking about things, they're going to call out those bad ones and we're going to course correct. And that if we can acknowledge that we've done that and that we're, we're constantly thinking like, okay, I tried this. I had the best of intentions. It worked great. Um, what can I build on? Or I tried this. It didn't work so well. What do we need to do? to refine and, and move in a different direction. And I think the more that you can include your team in that decision-making and, and um, have their input onto how that they feel about that trust that you're trying to build, because they'll be pretty quick to point it out if they don't have it, um, that that's what people are going to expect more and more. You know, we were talking before we started about the coming back to work in this current environment and you know that's all about trust right um it's it's got everything to do with us saying you know we're going to do our best to provide a safe environment and we're going to look to the people that we trust to provide us with the principles around that and we trust you to tell us when we've got it right and when we don't and and um, I think that that will be the paradigm shift for all of it. And um, I always think it's been there, but I think, you know, in the past, maybe it was more of a trust me. And now it'll be more of a let's trust together. Third on the list, the importance of clear and frequent communication. High performance leaders need to employ a variety of communication tools and techniques but also a growing toolbox of soft skills, including listening, empathy, and the ability to adapt their communication style when needed. Do you know what? Um, many, many years ago, when I took on one of my first sort of leadership roles, um, I, I had a CEO that asked me the following question. He said to me, Phil, what's the best way to communicate? And, and, I, and I had all of these answers about you know, internal communications, messaging. And they said to me, no, none of that's the right answer. The best way to communicate is by doing. Just do. If you do, you're going to get a result. If you do, there's nothing that speaks louder than your actions. And so what we have done, um, you know, and I've been in many organizations where we've had sort of engagement programs and how do we engage your employees and da 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 and it's like list and list of actions and what I've seen in my time in the last 10 years or so what works best is you come up with five things four or five things that you just do continuously and we call those the five leadership actions and and they are things like um, hold monthly meetings about your business KPIs hold your one-to-ones walk the floor, um, get around, walk the floor, talk to people, 
um, uh, 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 hold your hold your town hall meetings, and then the the fifth and last one is as leaders hold coffee mornings. We call it coffee mornings. It's basically informal gatherings where you say to everyone, "Hey, hey, folks, I'm uh, I'm in the I'm in the reception area. There's 15 chairs. I'll be there on Wednesday morning. Any topic goes, come and just come and have a coffee with me." And so we've taken those five things and we've done that relentlessly. Um, we, we hold, we hold uh, best practice learning sessions amongst the teams. We get the teams to present to us. We get people from their teams to present to us and we focus on those leadership actions. And, and I, I give you a sense of this, our employee engagement score, and we're humble about this. So I don't wanna, don't wanna make this um, as if we are proud Yeah, we're not. But our employee engagement score is typically always around the 70, 70 or just about 70%. And in the, in, 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 about a year ago, we got it to 78%. And in the beginning of the pandemic, we are now up to 84% employee engagement. So that's 84% of our people that say on a five score quadrant, they, it's, it's good or it's great. The two top scores on a five score quadrant um, um, to be in, in, engaged with us, and 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 we take this seriously. Um, uh, we t we take these feedback seriously. The score is less relevant than the fact that the comments we get that are uncomfortable from that score are the best value. Mm. Is to go and figure out what are what are those singular things that are still not resonating. And you know why I think these five things are, this is why I'm convinced this is the only way to work with people and to build trust in your culture is that, you know, we are all really, really busy and engagement and culture is not built by rules. You know, it's built, it's built by natural behaviors. It, it must be second nature for you to listen and if it's not second nature for you to listen, you're not going to listen. And so what we're trying to do with the five leadership actions um, is to, to, to make it second nature. And, and Marty, then your question about communication is answered in the best possible way. If my leadership stick to those five actions, they will, communication would come naturally. I think there's a, there's a couple of things that we did in the 90s that I thought were game changers. And um, we still use it today. There was a, um, I recognize I had a strategic planning process I put in place. And of course I, I had brought into the strategic planning our, our senior, senior leaders. And so I would go out of those planning sessions and then rely on the senior leaders to then spread the word. And I figured out pretty quickly that they only spread the word where they wanted to spread the word and where they didn't want to spread the word and keep themselves in power, they held it to themselves. And so I thought, this is not working very well. So I said to the team, um, I went, sat them all down and I said, guys, I'm not impressed with what I see happening. We've got a great strategic planning process here, but for some reason it's not getting through to our people. So I said, I'm going to develop a group of people and I'm going to call them the champions of change. And they're going to be in every department in this organization and they're not going to be management. And they're going to report directly to me. And they're going to be worked through our HR department and we're going to ask them questions. And they're going to bring those questions directly up to the top. And then I'm going to have information I want, and I'm going to give it directly down to them to disseminate it to the people. You're not going to be excluded from this process. You're going to be part of it. You're going to see it all. I'm not hiding anything, but I want you to know it's going to be transparent all the way through. And that's what we developed back then. And I got to say, that's probably one of the highlights that our employees say they have every year is that that process system we go through. Fourth, the importance of having a people-focused culture, high-performance cultures and high-performance leaders tend to be adept at balancing the performance needs of the organization with the personal needs of its employees. There's a mission statement for our people team and kind of our motto almost in terms of how we approach culture at Clio. The, the aspirational state is for us to be what we call human and high performing organization. And, and just to explain what we, we, we mean by that, what we see as being possible is to have a culture that is one of the highest performing cultures, one of the highest performing organizations 
in the world. We, we want to be one of the, the highest performing technology companies on the, on the planet. Um, and when you read about some of the highest performing technology companies on the planet, you, you hear, read about high performance, but you also read about people crying in their cubicles after work. You read about people churning out after two years at the company. You read about the company actually looking at employees as being fungible commodities that they, they burn out and spit out and replace with, with, with new people. And, and that is you know, very much the, the antithesis of the, the kind of culture we wanna create. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have what you call very human organizations uh, that uh, again, maybe almost veer towards this, this ruinous empathy end of the spectrum, very human organizations, but what might be middling or even low performance organizations that are just not having the impact that they want to, to have on the world. And, and our vision is that we can actually have both, that we can have a, a high performing, high impact organization that is accommodating the needs of its very human em employees in the process. And, and to me, what, what's at the heart of actually succeeding at, at what you pointed out, I think is on the surface, maybe what might seem like contradictory ideals, what, what is at the heart of reconciling that I think is being a deliberately developmental organization that is really plugging in and supporting your staff in stepping up to the challenges and the significant challenges that the company is throwing at them. So the, the idea is, hey, we're gonna throw some big audacious challenges at you. We're expecting you to work hard and step up to those challenges, but you're gonna have a whole suite of support systems around you to step up and succeed at those challenges. So just to give you a few examples of, of what we do to, uh, to help people with that, we have we developed a custom leadership development program called Basecamp that uh, every single one of our people, leaders, uh, and individual contributors that put their hand up and say, I wanna go through this program, will go through this Basecamp leadership development program to, to obtain a, a really core set of skills that we see in helping them navigate this, uh, this high performance environment. Uh, we have a dedicated internal coach that works with uh, our team members to help, uh, help develop them, help them tackle the, the significant challenges that might be uh, ahead of them. And uh, finally, this, this radical candor and, and ongoing feedback loop that we, we provide to employees puts them in a, in a really productive space where they've got continual and ongoing feedback on, on where they can improve and, and they're being pointed to resources that they can go to, to, to increase their, their bench strength and go and tackle uh, a, a new challenge. And those are some of the ways that, that we think we're, we're moving forward with and, and helping achieve that vision of being a, a high performing uh, and human organization. So employees who feel empowered, they, they take ownership of their work and they understand how their work furthers the company's goals. And so we've seen employees grow into jobs that didn't exist five to 10 years ago, and they've literally been developed out of the unique skill sets that they've developed while at CMH. And you know, internal promotions, succession planning, these have helped employees move between departments instead of leaving the company to go get the skill sets that they've wanted. And in terms of overall results, you know, we've been setting records every year since we began focusing on organizational health. And while I'm sure the outperformance is not solely attributable to this, I don't think that we could have grown the business as far and as fast without focusing on this culture. And last but not least, the importance of helping to build the next generation of leaders. As leaders, it's our responsibility to identify the skills, the passion, and the leadership aptitude in our team members. But beyond that, it's our responsibility to support the development of our people at every stage of their careers. I, I think the market still overvalues experience and undervalues attitude and aptitude. And I think if you're a leader and you're building your team, um, spend time with the people with the right aptitude, spend time with the people with the right attitude, and have the patience um, to teach them the domain that they're in or make up for their last lack of experience or be that safety net um, underneath them. I think it's sometimes in the short term, it seems more efficient. If I can just hire six guys that have built this before, wow, you know what, I can you know, spend time you know, writing reports for my bosses or, or you know, working on my PowerPoint presentation that I have to get done for the board. That's, that, that's 
that, that's not the path to innovation. That's not the path to, you know, differentiation. Um, so we need to, yeah, I, I think the, me the message I would give everybody is overvalue talent, overvalue attitude, um, and be careful that you're not overvaluing experience. For anyone who's uh, at a, in a senior leadership position, if you can mentor uh, someone who's coming along who you see some potential in and, and they come to you, they, I think I would encourage if it's possible to build that onto your calendar. It's just, it means so much to them and it opens so many windows to them uh, that they hadn't maybe thought of before. Um, from an employment perspective, making room for students in your workforce um, and, and really being honest with the institution that's sponsoring them to say they're hitting the mark or they're not. Uh, it will, they will only get better as a, uh, in the caliber of, of their education if, if industry is honest. And my experience is industry is very honest, um, which is great. Um, and, if, and to provide feedback as well and encouragement uh, I know I keep in touch, and of course I'm in a, you know, I'm not running a, a, a corporate environment, but, um, you know, to try and keep in touch and, and make forums so that students come back and uh, uh, as, and inviting and including even the students who've been in on, a, on an assignment. It, it means the world to them. They, their eyes are just aglow. And, you know, if there's possibilities of internships, there's often opportunities to share costs with educational institutions and so on. So it's not all borne by the, the actual company. So just looking at, at different uh, opportunities for them so they get launched well. Owning your culture, leading with trust and authenticity, communicating clearly and frequently, developing a people-focused culture and helping guide the next generation of leaders all great tips and all topics that we threw all of our interviews in 2020. I learned something new every time I look back at conversations we've recorded this year, and I'm truly excited for the conversations that we will have on deck for 2021. So stay tuned. We'll be back in January with new episodes of Building High Performance Cultures. And in the meantime, if you wish to learn more about the topic, please visit waterstonehc.com.